Okay, well, welcome to our uh, Senate District 46 Town Hall meeting. Uh, my name is Ron Latz. I'm the state senator from Senate District 46, uh, which covers St. Louis Park, Hopkins, about half of Golden Valley, uh, all of Medicine Lake, and a quarter of Plymouth. Uh, flanking me are my two uh, representatives. Uh, in this district, uh, Shirley Joachim on my right and Peggy Flanagan on my left, and they can uh, describe the communities they represent as well. Uh, a few opening uh, uh, preliminary remarks here. Uh, first of all, uh, this is a, a town hall meeting which we always do at the beginning um, of the legislative session. Uh, we do it so we can get input from the community. Uh, we'd like to hear what you have to say about issues uh, that uh, are likely to come before the state legislature. Um, I know there's a lot going on in the world today and nationally today, and we don't want to unnecessarily cut people off, but we do ask um, if you could uh, try to keep your attention focused on the state legislative issues, and of course, if you have something else that you want to comment on, you know, you know the floor is open, the mic is open, but uh, you know, we are state legislative representatives. Um, secondly, uh, we uh, typically go or schedule it for about an hour and a half, uh, so uh, out of respect to people's time, uh, we want to uh, identify that again. It's now about 6.10. We're getting started a few minutes later than uh, ex expected. Uh, so we'll go until about 7.40 uh, today, um, and then uh, we will formally adjourn the meeting at about that time. And those of you who wish to leave, of course, you can leave any time you want, um, but uh, that'll give an opportunity for people to leave if you wish to, and then... Uh, uh, we can stick around for a little bit after that to talk with folks individually if you'd like to uh, talk further about certain subjects. Uh, we are uh, airing this live uh, today, so I want to welcome the uh, viewers who are at home if you're watching this live or if you're watching this on a later uh, broadcast or recording. Uh, uh, as a result, I want to emphasize that it's important uh, that when we speak, uh, there's no opportunity to edit out comments. So please uh, be respectful to each other. Um, and uh, to the topics that you're discussing. Uh, this is a nonpartisan event, um, and there are no criteria for who's allowed to come here and speak or anything like that. So everyone is welcome. All of your comments are welcome. And if you disagree with something that is spoken, please be respectful and, uh, and react in a respectful manner. Uh, also, we have a microphone that's at the podium there in front of the city council uh, desk. Uh, because uh, this is being recorded also for a later broadcast, please, if you have a comment or a question, uh, go to the microphone. Uh, you can wait in line uh, patiently, and uh, we will do our best to answer questions or respond um, as, the, uh, as the occasion uh, uh, requires. Um, and then, uh, uh, but if, if you speak into the microphone, everyone can uh, understand what's going on and can, can be heard. Uh, so, oh, also, I guess, uh, try to keep your comments focused uh, so uh, that we don't have someone spending five or ten minutes doing a preamble uh, to a question or making a comment because there's so many people here. We want to give as many people an opportunity to, to participate um, as wish to do so if they want to ask questions or make comments. Uh, did I miss anything uh, for preliminary purposes? Just keep it clean, Senator Latz. Okay, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll do my best. Does um, that give me carte blanche? Okay. <laughs> um, it, it, uh, so I, I think I'm going to lay a little bit of the groundwork uh, for, uh, for my opening, uh, just sort of my opening comments as your senator. Um, and uh, I will keep it clean, but uh, we are in a new uh, environment at the state capitol compared to uh, years past. Um, as uh, Probably all of you know, um, after the election in November, there were changes in the majorities in the legislature uh, in the state Senate where I serve. Uh, so uh, I was in the majority and uh, chaired the Senate Judiciary Committee um, and served on the full finance committee, had the budget division for judiciary and public safety, and was on the Commerce Committee. With the change in the majorities, uh, I no longer have a gavel, so I'm not chairing the committee. I'm now the Democratic lead on the judiciary. Uh, and public safety budget and policy committees. Um, the jurisdiction has actually broadened a little bit uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the advent of the new majority. Uh, the Republican Party now has a majority of uh, 34 votes to 33 Democratic votes. And we can talk about the political implications of that as well, um, as, as you wish. Uh, but suffice it to say, I think there is greater incentive uh, for uh, both parties uh, to focus on finding consensus where we can 
um, and uh, developing uh, solutions to problems that Minnesotans are facing um, in a way that can pass the Senate. Um, and uh, there will be a greater incentive where we have very divisive issues for the caucuses to try to remain unified themselves too. But that's going to be a challenge probably for each caucus in turn, depending on the issue. Uh, so anyone who wants to talk more about sort of the political dynamics there, uh, it, it will come up probably in our discussion as well as we get into the issues. Um, I thought, uh, given the, uh, uh, the great changes, uh, that I would just take a moment to look back at my tenure in the legislature and share with you some of the work that I have been doing. Um, I continue to serve on the Commerce Committee. Over the course of my time there in the House and in the Senate, um, I've been on the Higher Education Committee. I've been on the K-12 Education and Policy Committee. I've been a member of the Early Childhood Caucus, which is a bipartisan, bicameral caucus uh, there. Um, I've served on the uh, uh, Business, Industry, and Jobs Committees, um, and of course on the, the full finance and uh, budget divisions uh, there as well. Uh, in that course of time, uh, both in the House and the Senate, I've introduced legislation and passed legislation on behalf of this community and on behalf of the, uh, the broader uh, state of Minnesota. So I thought I would just share with you a few of the things um, that I've been doing uh, while I've served in the legislature. Uh, in no particular order, certainly not in chronological order, uh, but there was an, a bill uh, a number of years ago called the Car Buyers Bill of Rights, uh, which was a consumer protection bill, particularly when auto dealers would run consumer credit reports. Um, I carried the 35W Bridge Collapse Survivors' Compensation Bill. Uh, I carried the uh, Hannah Montana Bill, uh, which sought to regulate the electronic sales of uh, tickets online. Um, I uh, carried the DWI Ignition Interlock Pilot Program um, that laid the groundwork for the statewide program, which is a public safety initiative for DWIs. Um, I carried um, the uh, Criminal Records Expungement Bill uh, the year before it ultimately got passed, uh, which again laid the groundwork and the foundation for that. Um, I passed the ban the box bill that applied to government employees or potential employees as they apply for uh, government. Uh, it, it passed in a broader form the next year, also expanding that to private employers of certain sizes across the state. Um, I carried a bill uh, regulating consumer debt collection uh, reforms. I carried the False Claims Act. Uh, which was authored by uh, Steve Simon in the House uh, when he was there, uh, pr uh, working to prevent fraud by uh, uh, people who are contracting uh, with the government or receiving government uh, payments. Um, the Child Victims Act, which reopened the uh, statute of limitations, a window for victims of child abuse to sue the perpetrators, uh, was also my bill, and Steve Simon carried the House bill on that one as well. Um, you'll notice I, I've worked closely with my legislators um, along the way, uh, with the representatives, and. and continue to do so and, uh, and, and appreciate that very much. Um, last year I carried a bias crimes enhancement bill that uh, uh, made penalty enhancements for those who commit felony level assaults based on the motivation of bias. Uh, for many years I carried the statewide smoking ban that extended to restaurants and bars. Uh, it took six years to get that passed. I'm sorry, five years, five sessions to get that passed while I was there. It had been worked on even before I was there. Um, I carried uh, a forensic lab accreditation bill mandating accreditation for uh, uh, scientific labs that are doing accredited work for criminal prosecutions. Um, I carried a bill to add sex traffickers to the predatory offender uh, registration list. Um, I carried uh, a bill uh, to uh, provide compensation for those who are wrongfully convicted and incarcerated in Minnesota um, after they get uh, ultimately determined to have been innocent. Um, I carried what was called the Red Flag Bill, prohibiting domestic abusers uh, from possessing firearms after they're convicted of domestic abuse uh, violence crimes. Uh, I carried the Automated License Plate Reader Bill, um, setting forth the uh, requirements for the uh, way the data is handled for that, um, and also the Body Camera Data uh, Requirements Bill. Um, I carried a bill and passed a bill to prohibit straw purchasers of firearms, uh, people who have clean records that are purchasing the guns on behalf of others who are not eligible to lawfully purchase firearms. And I also passed a bill to prohibit the possession of ammunition for firearms for those who are already prohibited from possessing the firearm itself. Uh, last year I carried the, the major drug sentencing reform bill, uh, the most significant uh, changes in drug sentencing in 29 years since the sentencing guidelines were passed in Minnesota. Uh, which will have the beneficial effect not only of reducing 
the long-term uh, rate of incarceration and prison population issues, but most importantly, we'll be treating drug offenders uh, who are addicts, more like addicts, and treating the dealers who are in it for economic reasons more like dealers, strengthening the penalties uh, for those folks. For many years, I carried the legislation to fund the Southwest uh, Light Rail Transit uh, Initiative, as uh, most of you probably know. Uh, that is uh, thankfully off the legislative agenda this year because it is being funded. Um, and uh, it took a lot of work on behalf of all of us here to make that happen um, and, uh, and work among uh, many other agencies, the Metropolitan Council and Governor Dayton. Uh, but that will be happening, and, and uh, I think we're all grateful that's not going to be part of our legislative agenda this year. Uh, so with that said, um, it lays a foundation for what we have coming up. Uh, this is a budget year, uh, which means we'll be passing, uh, setting a two-year budget for, uh, because the state budget's on a two-year cycle. Uh, starting this July 1 is the next biennium, so we will have to pass a budget by then or there will be uh, no funding for uh, government agencies to continue their work. <clears throat> As the uh, lead Democrat on the Judiciary and Public Safety Budget Division, um, I will be focusing my attention in the budget um, on uh, the Department of Corrections, on uh, police uh, training, um, on the BCA funding to uh, shorten the backlog um, that's already there with regard to uh, analyzing evidence that comes into their lab, um, the uh, Department of Public Safety, including Office of Justice programs, which funds a lot of crime prevention initiatives, including uh, youth intervention programs. Um, and uh, sex trafficking initiatives. Uh, and um, we also have the Department of Human Rights uh, within our jurisdiction. And uh, in the past, um, I have been successful in increasing funding for the Department of Human Rights and in some years fighting off efforts to reduce the funding and the size of the Department of Human Rights. Um, and I'll do everything I can to support their uh, funding uh, this year. Uh, the other, other than that jurisdiction within my committee work, I think the two most important things we'll be focusing on will be transportation. We definitely need a long-term transportation funding plan in place that is one that will support multimodal transportation initiatives. Uh, we have been fighting this battle for years. We're at least $6 billion short uh, just on our highways and bridges and other uh, existing transportation infrastructure that we need to catch up on. Um, and we can't do it out of just revenue streams that are currently in the system. The gas tax is insufficient, um, and that's the dedicated funding. Uh, and we don't want to take all of our general fund money to pour it into transportation. So I would like to see uh, an increase in the gas tax. I'm open to other forms of dedicated funding as well, although I worry when we ta start talking about car repair um, taxes and stuff like that, that it's going to take money out of the general fund where it goes now. Uh, so it would create something of a gap there that we'll have to be <coughs> cognizant of. But if it's transportation related, um, I'm open to discussing that uh, also. And the other major category of funding that I will be focusing on is our K-12 education system and our pre-K system. The governor has proposed uh, a 2 percent increase in each of the years on the formula, the basic formula for funding our K-12 system. I fully support that um, and I support the governor's initiatives. Um, on uh, the pre-K uh, uh, funding uh, for programs there. Uh, personally, and, and it's uh, ironically, or not ironically, uh, uh, coincidentally, I had a visit from a constituent from Golden Valley on this topic in my office uh, just today. Um, if I were personally right in the budget, I would focus even more directly on the ages zero uh, to five rather than starting just the year before kindergarten. So to the extent that I can influence uh, funding in that direction, I will be doing that. Uh, but I fully support uh, the funding initiatives that are on the table as well. Uh, this is also uh, going to be quite possibly a bonding year. Normally we do bonding in the non-budget year, but as uh, we did not pass a bonding bill last year, and, and anyone who wants to talk about how that ended, I'm happy to go into it. <laughs> Uh, but uh, we didn't pass a bonding bill, left a lot of very important infrastructure projects uh, unfunded um, in an era of low interest rates. Um, and uh, at least in the last several years, uh, having the, uh, the infrastructure, the, the labor capacity uh, to, to do that, uh, that work at uh, competitively low prices uh, compared to a full boom in the construction industry. Uh, we should do it now, uh, even if we couldn't get it done last year. And the governor has 
uh, proposed a robust $1.4 billion uh, bonding bill or uh, infrastructure funding bill. Um, and I support that. Included in the governor's proposal is uh, the funding for an ex expansion of perspectives in St. Louis Park, which uh, I've carried um, and which I will fully support. Uh, we're also looking for funding for the Perpet Center um, and for uh, an underpass for pedestrians at the, uh, at the Perpet Center intersection there at Douglas and Highway 55 in Golden Valley, um, and a number of other uh, infrastructure projects uh, in, um, in our communities. Uh, and then uh, in terms of policy, there's going to be a lot of policy, and I'm sure we have plenty of conversations on that. I will just note um, a couple of uh, initiatives that I'll be working on. Uh, one, I've introduced the College Affordability Act, uh, which would uh, provide uh, free college tuition uh, for all of those uh, Minnesotans uh, in families earning under $125,000 per year at the public institutions of higher education in Minnesota, University of Minnesota and all of the Minsky system, two and four year uh, colleges. Uh, and that would be after accounting for other student financial aid that's available, whether federal aid or other s existing state aid programs, but this would close the tuition gap so that our students could go uh, to school without worrying about the additional financial burden of uh, at least the tuition portion of it. Um, and anyone who wants to talk about that, please bring it up. I'm happy to go into more detail. Uh, and I do expect that, just, I'm just going to touch on one other topic, and, and my colleagues and all of us can talk about all sorts of other things. Uh, gun violence prevention. Um, I've carried uh, uh, the uh, major gun violence uh, prevention initiatives in the last several years. I presided as chair of the committee over some rather robust uh, and, and energetic hearings at the Capitol on the topics. Um, some of the uh, introductions in the past uh, uh, month um, have uh, m tried to move us in, in my judgment in exactly the wrong direction in terms of gun violence prevention. But I believe that the public continues to support and if we had uh, legislature voting the way their constituents would ask them to vote as a whole, uh, we would be able to pass my initiatives on universal background checks for all uh, firearms purchases and the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Gun Violence Protective Orders Act, which would allow family members to seek uh, court orders banning certain other family members who are exhibiting uh, dangerous behavior uh, from possessing uh, firearms. Uh, so with that said, I'm a realist too. Um, I know not everything is going to pass that I'd like to see pass this year, and much of the session will be spent playing defense. Uh, but uh, that's what I'm up there to do on behalf of our community, uh, to try to get through what we can that we think will benefit the state and to hold the majority accountable uh, when uh, that needs to be done, and I'm perfectly comfortable in that role also. Uh, with that said, uh, um, I want to turn it over to my colleagues. Uh, Cheryl, we'll go back to seniority, I suppose, and then... It's fine with me. All I'll right. back clean up. There you go. <laughs> all right. First of all, I'm Cheryl Uwakim. I represent all of Hopkins and half of St. Louis Park, mostly South Minnetonka Boulevard. It's uh, my second term. And I want to say thank you for all of you that are here. It warms my heart to see this room so filled up. For those of you at home watching, there's over 110 rough count people here. Um, and I don't even know how many more are in the hallway. So thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, it's really important for us to hear your voices. I do a coffee and uh, community conversation every two weeks. You can look on my house website for those dates all the way through April. I'd love to have. I'd love to have an audience like this here. Unfortunately, I usually only get like anywhere between 1 and 20. So please look at those dates and consider coming. Um, but I think one of the number one lessons we've all learned this year is that elections do matter. And we are living in a new environment right now with the Senate being in Republican control, which is fine. We're in the minority in the House and have been since I got elected two years ago. Um, one interesting and heartwarming fact, and I'm, I'm probably stealing this from Peggy because she was probably going to mention it too. In the House DFL caucus right now, we have 28 women and 29 men. So, we are we are 28 to 29 right now, and there's a, a special election coming up on Valentine's Day up by North Branch. And if a DFL woman wins, we will be 29 and 29. So that could be interesting. We also have nine people of color, and it's just been an amazing difference in our caucus to have more voices heard. Um, I let's see. I sit on three different committees. I'm on the Government Operations and Elections Committee again. I'm also on Property Taxes and Local Government. 
and then I asked to be placed on the transportational, transportation and regional governance policy committee because I'm not as optimistic as Senator Latz is about having Southwest completely buttoned down. <laughs> there are still a few shenanigans that can be played, so I, 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 I gave up higher ed so that I could be on the transportation policy committee. Um, I. I have to echo Senator Latz's statements. There's a lot of stuff coming down the pike. We didn't get a bonding bill last year. We haven't had a comprehensive transportation bill in years. We didn't have a tax bill. So we have stuff left over from last session, plus we have budgets to set this year, policy. Um, you saw us um, address some of the health care premium issue at the beginning of session, even though that was a very rocky start. It should have been done during a special session. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot more interesting things coming up. Um, the House and Senate just set their joint deadlines. They're coming around the corner fast. First policy deadline, second policy deadline, and budget deadlines are all going to be done by March 23rd, I believe. So. Um, Things are already moving at a fast pace. I, I help with a weekly orientation with the freshman DFL, and we were I was ex, I was explaining it like a pacer test that your kids take at school, where it starts out slow and gets faster and faster. Well, it's kind of started out fast already, so it's been interesting. Um, this year, I'm kind of focused on a few different bills. I'm carrying this old house, this old shop again, which gives a tax credit for folks that when they improve an older property or an old commercial building. I have that up at 8.15 bright and early tomorrow morning, so <laughs> I, I think it's doing well in the House. I'm not sure if it's going to get anywhere in the Senate. I, I think you. Yeah, I, carried, I carried it last year and so did Senator Latz. Um, my first year I got a several working group passed to see what we could do about folks that wander off with Alzheimer's or dementia, and the recommendations came back to beef up our missing, uh, missing persons alert and crime network which costs money, so now I'm trying to get the money to do that, so that's another bill I'm working on. I also had the St. Louis Park High School and Ju Hopkins High School journalism teachers bring me a bill about student press freedom, and that's for 7th through 12th grade high schoolers, and we added colleges in this year, so we're going to be pushing on that, and that just allows students to print their thoughts and their opinions as long as they're not libel, slanderous, or disruptive of the school day. Um, and so they could print respectfully in journalistic standards. The only thing a, a, school, a school could not prohibit them from printing if it just makes the school look bad. <laughs> so I'm working on that. And then probably one of the number one thing that's been taking a lot of my time is trying to f um, shape a bill to register cooling towers. I don't know if many of you saw the news this summer. Hopkins had a Legionnaire outbreak. We had 24 people that were sick and one died. And uh, they finally pinpointed after a month of investigation or between the first people getting sick and then finally finding the source uh, that it was a cooling tower. And the, and the Department of Health said one of the biggest holdbacks they had from finding it right away is that they had no idea where coo the cooling towers were. Now, you can get Legionnaires through many other sources. Most of those sources are already regulated. So they were looking on Google Maps at tops of buildings to try to find the cooling towers so they could go out and test. Um, I have been having a very interesting time with the bill and a big pushback from the industry and lobbyists from D.C. flying out to, to jump up and down on my head. So if anybody would like to chat about that, see me afterwards. Um, but, you know, above all, oh, and another thing was so, when we talk about investment in light rail and being really excited about Southwest light rail, there's a real concern that all that, all that is going to stop with um, some of the new administration right now and I have to say I was really heartened to see the Metro Council and Economic Development came out with a story today that there's been 6.8 billion dollars 6.8 billion dollars I had to look at it twice because it was that million or was that billion of investment in our cities and economic development along the green line the existing green line the existing blue line the proposed extension of the green line which is Southwest Light Rail and the proposed extension of the Botano line of the blue line which is Botano so we do know that it brings an economic development into our cities, which expands the tax base, which lowers the tax taxes for all of us. So there's, besides moving people around, it does a lot of other good things. And I, I, uh, I did see a, a shake in the <laughs> shake of a head in the back, because I'm mean, not excited, but I'm, I'm excited. Um, above all, I just want to thank you. Thank you, thank you for being here. We really want to hear about your issues and concerns. So I am going to toss it over to Peggy.
Thank you, Cheryl. Um, so I'm Peggy Flanagan. I uh, represent the A side of the district, which is St. Louis Park, Golden Valley, uh, Plymouth, and Medicine Lake. Um, I'm in my second term, um, and I'm just really excited to see everybody here. It is, you all look great. <laughs> so thank you so much for um, for coming out tonight. Uh, so the, the uh, committees that I sit on, um, there's only one that I'm returning to. Um, so I'm still on the rules committee. Otherwise, all of my committee assignments are brand new. So I'm on uh, Health and Human Services Policy. Uh, I'm the DFL lead on the subcommittee on child care. Um, and I'm on state government finance. Uh, so there's been uh, a bit of a learning curve for me on state government finance, but I'm excited to be there. Um, and it sort of feels like coming home uh, being uh, the lead on the subcommittee on affordable child care uh, because that's much of the work um, that he did as an advocate uh, as the executive director of Children's Defense Fund. So um, feels exci it's exciting to sort of dig in on that on the on the policy side. Um, so some of the the bills that I am working on right now um, may not be a surprise to some of you who've heard me talk about this before, but is the equity coach bill um, uh, within St. Louis Park. Uh, there's a great program in the schools which coaches uh, teachers um, to uh, be uh, more intentional about their work um, and teaching of students of color. And uh, they've seen really uh, incredible gains um, and progress. And so I've been working closely with a group of uh, teachers in St. Louis Park um, and with the district to put this together so that will uh, uh, be uh, ready to go this week, as well as another bill in the same vein, um, which will create a pool of, of dollars available to other districts um, to be able to model uh, the good work that's happened in St. Louis Park and be able to draw um, from some of those things. And so um, I'm sure if you've heard a lot, we talk a lot about this achievement gap um, in Minnesota, and we've got one of the largest achievement gaps in the country. And so often people are like, gosh, we just don't know what to do about it. Well, we actually do know what to do about it. Um, and it's to be intentional in supporting our teachers and coaching them how to work better um, with our students of color. And I think St. Louis Park uh, has a great model. We are a small enough district that's able to be robust and, and um, is also just limber and in, in sort of trying new things. And I think this is a really exciting opportunity. Um, additionally, I am authoring uh, a couple of bills on access uh, to childcare and childcare affordability, both with, um, uh, right now we have a, uh, a statute in place which allows for um, at-home infant care uh, for parents to stay home in the first year if they are eligible for the child care assistance program. Um, right now there's no money um, that's allocated for that and that was a bipartisan effort to put that bill together so I'm looking to put some some funding towards that as well as um, some tax incentives for businesses to uh, open child care. Um, we especially find in rural Minnesota this can be a real a real challenge for families um, so working with my my friends in greater Minnesota uh, to work on that issue uh, and also looking at the possibility of co-ops for child care of having local families um, working together to look at opportunities for at-home infant care or community-based uh, child care centers. Um, so much of the work that uh, I am focused on as, as Senator Latz was talking about is focused on uh, zero to three or for school aged children who need access to, um, to child care. Uh, the other uh, pieces of legislation um, is I've uh, introduced a bill on culture, having cultural uh, relevant and cultural competence around doula care. Um, so ensuring um, that we are helping to close some of those uh, racial equity gaps as it relates to birth outcomes. Um, so I'm excited uh, to have introduced uh, that bill as well. And of course, as Ron talked about, we all are, are supporting um, uh, dollars for perspectives. Um, uh, I'm carrying the bill for the underpass under Highway 55 as you watch young people played like it looks like Frogger and as a mom I get just super scared every time I see young people running across the street so um, I'm eager to, to try to get that done um, this year as well. Um, and then of course uh, one of the bills that I've heard from many of you about uh, is the bill that has been introduced by Representative Nick Zerwas uh, regarding uh, uh, the protest bill um, as it's been come to, <laughs> I see some nods, okay, uh, 
Uh, so you're familiar with what I'm talking about, which would increase penalties um, for protesters. And um, what I have heard resoundingly is that uh, folks are interested in protecting um, our right to peacefully assemble. And um, I have just appreciated hearing from you. So I've been trying to work with some of my colleagues uh, to ensure that our voices are heard with uh, regards to that matter. And then the last thing that I wanted to lift up, uh, Representative Joachim spoke to this a little. We doubled our amount of people of color and Native Americans um, in our caucus, uh, which is very exciting. Um, it, we're up to nine. It's, it's, you know, but still exciting, right? Um, and one of the things that we've been able to do is create something we're calling the Pocky Caucus, which is people of color and indigenous caucus um, to be able to work together, yes, uh, to be able to work together both in the House but also um, with folks in the Senate, on the Senate side as well. So that's exciting. And we've got a work group which Cheryl is a part of as well for our racial and economic disparities. Um, we've had a lot of folks who said like, oh, well, they talked about racial and economic disparities last year. So we did that. It's fine. Um, it's done. Uh, but we know we have more work to do. Uh, and so um, that is something that we are also uh, continuing to work on uh, together um, with folks from all different cultural communities um, within uh, the, House, uh, the House caucus. So um, I'm eager to get to uh, many of your, uh, your questions and, and hear from you. And just would point out that um, somewhere in the back is my legislative assistant, Akola Day. Um, and uh, he has additional information, sign-up sheets, but he's kind of your guy if you need to, to reach out to me, and I just wanted to take a brief moment to just acknowledge him because he's been um, just a, a great uh, addition to our team. So thanks for being here, Cola Day, um, and uh, it looks like people are ready to ask some questions. <laughs> Well, as, as you're getting prepared, I'll just don't know two other local things that I know we're all working toward. Uh, one is uh, St. Louis Park has asked for some uh, state funding to help with the water treatment facility improvements that they have to go through. Uh, so we're going to try to find some state funding for that. Um, and uh, once again, uh, we'll be looking to uh, provide for community education revenue increases, um, something we've carried for a long time. Well, Cheryl's got the bill uh, in the House, and I'm, I'm carrying it in the Senate. Uh, and uh, Maybe one of these days we'll get them to increase the formula. We, we were successful a little bit, small increases in the past, but we'll keep working on that too. Uh, oh yeah, jump. One more thing I forgot to mention, and Peggy was there last night too. So just so you know that we do work across the aisle very well. Uh, it's taken me two years, but I talked to talked to other Republican colleagues in the House into this because now. The House Republican Caucus has a historic number of women in their body, too. They have 20 women to 57, or 56 men. But um, I decided it was high time we had a bipartisan women's happy hour that will hopefully <laughs> turn into a caucus. So um, it took me two years to get it done, but we had our first one last night, and we're going to have many more. So Don't ask what okay. went on there. That's <laughs> we ate nachos. Just yes. so, yes. yeah. <laughs> All right, let's start right up. Uh, and, and for everyone, please, uh, when you get to the mic, please just state your Identify. name and the, the okay. city that you live in as well. For our okay. Audience. Well, thank you for coming, guys. Good to see you. I'm Judy Reiner, Precinct 3, St. Louis Park, formerly Precinct 5, Hopkins. And first of all, I'd like to really uh, talk about finance, government finance. Uh, it looks like things are going to happen that will really cause problems in the future. At the federal level, it looks like they're going to be giving you a block grant instead of having the regular streams of money coming on revenue sharing. So then it'll be up to you to decide where to put that money. Of course, we have a problem with, uh, you know, local governments like cities and counties can levy. Yes, they can. Uh, city uh, School districts have to beg for money with a referendum. But I am concerned about a variety of things that are going to be set aside. One would be, of course, um, some of the smaller towns in Minnesota who do who need uh, increase to increase their uh, water and sewer works and don't have the money or the tax base to do it. So they need the LGA, the local government aid, and I don't know if that money is going to be available to them. They can tax, but they won't have enough. Uh, also, we will, um, <laughs> if you do a lot of heavy duty taxing on the um, property tax side, you have this 80 year old couple who have paid off their mortgage and now here comes a big tax bill. And then the federal Congress will go, oh yay, we reduce the deficit, but it's on the backs of local government. And so that's one of my big concerns. And then it will be um, health and human services will probably take a hit. Um, as an elder <laughs> in the tribe now, I am concerned about what will happen with um, Social Security. 
Medicare, Medicaid, and Housing and Redevelopment Authority buildings like mine for seniors. Um, the person in charge of housing now is a neurosurgeon. Doesn't know too much about housing. So that's going to be a bit of a problem. Um, so that, I am concerned about that. The environmental issues, that's going to be another one that's going to hit us because they have, at the federal level, embraced fossil fuels with gusto. And so that means we will have increased uh, floods and droughts and large uh, tornadoes and on the coast hurricanes. And oddly enough, with fracking, which is a fossil fuel procurement kind of thing, you can see in Oklahoma what's happening. They're having what? They're not even in a tectonic plate <laughs> area, but you know where, it's, where there's a rift like the, uh, the one on the west coast, but they're having earthquakes. And our neighbor to the east, Wisconsin, is doing fracking. So it is disconcerting. We're going to have to look at the environment. And also education. Uh, the new Secretary of Education likes to give money to public and private schools and likes charter schools, which I also like, but they're not school districts. And St. Louis Park and Hopkins have school districts as well as Robbinsdale in our district. And so we have to be concerned about maintaining sufficient funding for that. So please do not give back to any of us the money you have in account now, the money that's unreserved. Keep it. We're going to need it for all of these things and more. Um, but how do we get more money at the federal level? Well, taxation, of course, but we're looking at some really big cuts for the wealthy and for the corporate there. And as you know, uh, if you incorporate overseas, which a lot of companies do, Cayman Islands, mm, 18,000 American corporations incorporated there, they don't pay into the treasury, but they want us as citizens to buy their b goods and services to help them be profitable, and they want us to also put money in the treasury to keep the society alive. Not good, but is it going to change? No. So I am very concerned about the finances up and down the line. I'm not anti-business. I served on the West, Cha West Suburban Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors for three years, went to the legislature and lobbied for product liability issues, also owned my own business stateside and overseas, as did my father before me. However, we have to be very careful. Don't let us become a right-to-work state. I have lived in a right-to-work state. It's a misnomer. It means the right to not be able to organize the workers. And uh, 50 years ago, 35% of our workers were union, now about 9%. My great grand my grandmother's sister died in a Baltimore mill at age 11. Yes, the unions got rid of child labor. They gave us um, a lot of things like OSHA to protect people and also workers' compensation for those that were injured. So please, don't let us become a work right to work state and don't let us have fracking. I just love you guys. <laughs> you know, this is one thing that I have to say. People may not know how government and business operates necessarily, or all these weird little terms I've been using, but they do understand Star Wars. And I have read both the Republican and Democratic, Democratic Party platforms. I will say in the Democratic Party platform, it appears that Obi-Wan Kenobi, in the figure of Bernie Sanders from Vermont, got a lot of his stuff in there, and we know that tens of thousands of people under the age of 35 came forward because he was their Jedi Knight. And I say to you now, as Princess Leia said, Help us, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're our only hope because you're all that's left to protect us from craziness. Thank yes. you so And much, the protesting. Judy. I was a protester forever. <laughs> yes, yes. Al Alabama, Texas, civil rights, voting rights, et cetera. Judy, thank you, thank thank you Judy. for your comments. Uh, appreciate that. And uh, we'll also note the uh, unions brought us the weekend. Yeah. So. yeah. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, go ahead, please. Hi. Brenda Berglund from St. Louis Park. Wanted to start by saying... I oppose the bill to treat bicycle riders like car drivers. I don't know why anybody from Byron would even care. Also, Ron, I saw that you were featured on the news opposing, I believe, bringing non or for-profit insurance companies into Minnesota business. I was very surprised. I don't know if you'll have a moment to talk about why some Democrats voted for that what the implications are for our nonprofit insurance companies that we already have. And then for Cheryl and Peggy, is the House going to be as dysfunctional? Are the Republican leaders in the House going to be as dysfunctional for the third year in a row as, as they have shown themselves to be? And Ron, is the new majority leader going to be easier for Governor Dayton to work with? <laughs> As for the house dysfunction, I already see some um, time mismanagement, so I'm a little concerned even with the five months that, you know, we're not going to get things done. I think moving the deadlines up was actually good because 
I think they're expecting to send one round of budget bills to the governor and, and expecting their veto, having them come back and having time to rework them. So time will tell to see how that goes. Um, I will take on the, the health insurance premium question because I did vote yes in the House and it was hard for me to vote yes, but when I was door knocking I heard from quite a few small business owners and individuals that were hitting that gap before Medicaid that really, really needed the help on the 25% premium and when they finally agreed to the governor's way to distribute it so it got to people by April. It was hard to stomach the rest. I talked to some of our folks on our side of the caucus in the House DFL that really know insurance much better than I do. I've sat down with two different providers and I'm meeting with another one on Friday to kind of understand. But it's we were the last state in the country to not allow for-profits in our HMO plan, but for-profits have been able to sell in other parts of our market. And it's our hope that we're going to still be able to get some legislation through to put some bookends on that. It's hard to tell with what's coming down from the federal government how anything's going to play out. So making sure that we got the premiums out to folks, started seeing the types of changes they're going to try to make to the market. We beat back a horrible, horrible amendment that would have allowed insurance companies to sell plans that didn't have cancer treatment, diabetes coverage, mm -hmm. screening for Lyme's disease. I mean, it was just a, it was a huge list of things that that amendment was taken off, thank goodness. So it's, it's really hard when you have really good things in the bill and then some really bad things because there was also continuity of care for people getting treatments. So I did vote yes, and that was because, but it was, <laughs> it was hard to press that button. And I think... Um, we have a lot of folks on our side that are fighting hard to make sure folks are held accountable in the insurance agency and to look at real reforms that will create real cost savings for people, not money for insurance companies. So that's kind of where I fall, fall on that. So, uh, Brenda, I just I take it that your surprise was that some Democrats voted for the uh, the bill that included for profit insurance. Is that I want to make sure I understand your comment. Okay. Um, a couple of things on that. Uh, I'm not categorically opposed to for-profit health insurance, although I am very skeptical about its appropriateness. Um, but I want to keep a mind open a little bit so I can analyze whatever came before us. Uh, my biggest concern about that was the, the rush to make such a major change. It's been 40 years since we've had for-profit health insurance in Minnesota. Uh, and within just a couple of hours of hearings and a couple of weeks of the legislative session starting, they rushed a bill out the door, which they only did because they had the leverage that they had saved by not agreeing to a special session uh, to get the health insurance uh, refunds out to the people who are making decisions in the individual market. Uh, so my biggest concern was that there were going to be gaps and conflicts and ambiguities um, in that for-profit health insurance language, uh, in addition to the concern about the very concept of it, which is those who will be deciding whether to give you coverage on those gray area cases are going to be more concerned. In fact, we'll have a fiduciary duty to make it a profitable enterprise to save money so they can give it back to their shareholders or save it for their shareholders rather than to grant coverage where it's appropriate. Um, but that said, there needed to be those bookends, as Cheryl uh, stated, and I didn't think we had sufficient time in the process to do that. And I spent a lot of my time and my remarks on the floor on that, uh, decrying the rush to judgment on those parts of the bill. Uh, so I guess, you know, time will tell. Um, I, I'd be willing to bet very, you know, a lot of money on the fact that we're going to have another bill coming through this session uh, to fix some of the things that uh, they didn't get to take care of in the first two weeks um, with that. Um, and uh, I understand the, the desire to, uh, to get that money out to the people who needed the refunds. I mean, the, the Republican proposal, I thought, was uh, it was just a bargaining chip. Because I heard from the Republican caucus, members of the Senate Republican caucus, that they knew the governor's plan was a better way to do it. Because instead of making people wait until 2018, have to shell out the money themselves first, if they can afford to do so, get the refund in a year, uh, they would get an immediate reduction in the bill that's due when it could get it from the insurance company for the premiums. Um, and a, a much more streamlined process wouldn't have to set up a state government bureaucracy uh, to uh, issue refund checks either. 
so I understand uh, that need. The, the only other really obje big objection I had to that bill was the fact that they took that money out of the reserves rather than out of our current year surplus. We have sufficient funds in our current biennial surplus to have paid that 320 some million dollars. But instead they took it out of the budget reserves, which we have fought so hard and, and I have really focused on in our fiscal decision making to build up reserves in the state so that when the inevitable downturn comes and, and revenues fall, we have a safety net of, of funding to be able to not have to slash programs like we've done in the past and then start ravaging not only programs but special funds and one-time money to try to fill the gaps. Uh, so that was another thing I felt very strongly about. Uh, we should not have taken it out of reserves. Um, as to Majority Leader Gazelka, um, I've, no, I've served with him now for uh, uh, quite a few years. Um, he's, a, he's a smart, capable guy. His personality is much more conducive to getting along with him. Um, I think he's going to prove to be um, a, a, an easier person to negotiate with. But let's not uh, mistake that for him being willing to be flexible and compromising on, on policy positions. I think that will remain to be seen. Um, I have hopes that the, the Senate Republican Caucus will be more flexible than I think the House Republican Caucus will be. And part of that is because of the, just the membership that make up those caucuses. Uh, there are new members in the Senate, and I don't know them all very well. I'm sure it's a bit more to the right than it was uh, last time around. But the House is really far to the right, and they have been for a number of years. And uh, Speaker Dowd is going to um, be pulled to the right, even if he's not already there himself personally. I think Majority Leader Gazelka is going to be easier to deal with. And he may end up being the, the kind of broker, the go-between, uh, to help get things done in the final uh, estimate. Uh, but let's make no mistake about it, uh, the, re the majorities in the legislature are going to pass initiatives that answer to the campaigns that they ran. Um, and, uh, and, and some of them are going to be some pretty tough issues for us to, to deal with. Um, and we're going to have to be rely on our governor to veto those bills and send them back. Because they're going to send bills that have 90 percent stuff everyone agrees with, with one provision that we all disagree with. I mean, even no matter what you think about Real ID, uh, the, the Senate um, committee today threw a gun registration provision in it, um, prohibiting the sharing of data on, uh, on firearms uh, transfers. Um, so I mean, they're going to slip this stuff in, and uh, we're going to have to fight it and watch for it, number one, and fight it uh, as on number two. So I'll just real, real quick um, and just want to just lift up one piece, which is um, it sort of didn't get the fanfare that I think it really deserved for a host of reasons. But um, the governor introduced a, a public option um, for health care. And, uh, you know, this is simply a way for folks to, to buy into Minnesota care. It's not free, um, but it gives people more op more options. And as we talk about the individual market and competition, like this is is one of the ways we can get there. So I would just encourage you, um, uh, as my colleagues have said, you know, it might be a little rough going for some of the issues that we're talking about here tonight. Um, but it's really important that we continue to hear from you about your priorities so we can tell our colleagues, I received X amount of emails, this many phone calls, um, but also for the governor to hear from folks. Um, he's going to be uh, really pivotal uh, in, in how things turn out. And so uh, for him to know that, that uh, uh, we have his back on these particular issues and that there's some things that we think he should really uh, stand firm, um, um, that's just going to be really helpful for him to hear from all of you. So thank you. Andy. I'd like, I'd like to echo that. The governor needs to hear from you. I, I was very happy to see his public option, option and that's one of the things that can help mitigate that cost in the for-profits coming in too is that it'll be an affordable option for folks and we got to understand in the in the metro area we have a lot of options down here and some of the greater minnesota counties we have one program to choose from so this would at least give them another program to choose from that's affordable but by the way i think the cost to to implement it was under was it 12 million it's under like 12 million dollars to implement and then it's completely fee driven the, the premiums pay for the program. So it's and it's an incredible option and I think that will that will really help things too. So 
Hi, I'm Randy Anderson. Uh, I wear a lot of hats. Uh, Senator Latz, I've worked with you. Thank you for the drug sentencing reform last year. You're probably not used to seeing me without my provocative T-shirt on. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Representative Yoakum, I'm saying your name wrong. I apologize. And uh, Representative Flanagan, thank you guys for having us here today. Uh, so, wow. So I'm going to try to keep it concise into just a, a one one main thing, basically. So I, I'm a person of long-term recovery. Uh, first of all and foremost, second, I, I'm a steering committee for the Second Chance Coalition. I'm on the board of directors for the Stephen Elmer Hope Foundation, and I'm an alcohol and drug counselor at RC and Men's Treatment Center. So uh, most of my concerns are around substance use disorder or addiction, as most of you might know it as. So uh, I've read some of the governor's, what, his, uh, what he th feels should go or where we should go with substance use disorders, and I agree with most of it. What I wanted to talk about today, though, is uh, the Steve Rumler Hope Foundation is introducing a bill this year called the Minnesota Opioid Stewardship Bill. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it yet or not. We haven't got a bill number yet. We have pretty final language. But what we're hoping to do is hold the pharmaceutical com companies accountable for what the opioid epidemic that they've created. Uh, they have made a product that perpetuates and increases addiction unbelievable. What we're hoping to do is attach a fee to every milligram of equivalent morphine sold, one cent fee. And what that will do for the state of Minnesota is it could add as much as $480 million annually. Uh, now, uh, we know already we've been told there's dozens of lobbyists already here in Minnesota from the pharmaceutical companies. And uh, what I'm asking you guys to do as representatives is to uh, identify those people <laughs> uh, and not uh, not listen to them, I'd like to say, but I know you have to listen to them. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, the addiction is an undertreated health condition, and it has to end. And I think, thank you, Senator Latz, for the work you did last year to, to help that. Uh, we have more work to do. Uh, we got shot down a couple months ago by the, uh, the hearing there, and we had in December again, but we're still going to continue forward. We're setting up programs through the Second Chance Coalition and that fund that we're hoping to uh, implement soon. But I just want to say, when you guys see this bill come across your desk, uh, and we haven't decided the name for it yet, uh, the one lady that works on our board her lost her daughter a year ago is named Casey Joe. So we may call it the Casey Joe Bill. It's more than likely what it's going to be ended up being named. But it's the Minnesota Opioid Stewardship Bill, and I just really, we need this for Minnesota. It's not, it won't cost us anything uh, as a state. It'll hold the pharmaceutical county companies accountable for this epidemic that they've created. And uh, there's so much more I'd like to talk to you about, but I am sure I'll see you guys many more times this year. And I appreciate the work you do, and we'll be in touch. Thank you. So. Thank you, Randy. Thank you. Great recommendations. I'm Elaine Wynn. I am from Golden Valley. I, I want to thank you, the three of you, for the many things you've talked about here tonight that not only make the lives of people in our state more humane and more functional, but you save money with it. Thank you. Um, I want to say that I, I'm just all of these issues are very important to me that have come up here tonight, but I want to say that I can't, I, I'm just driven by climate change. And I want to know what is in the hopper, what it is, is if there are things we can support. I was so excited to hear that the two of the 11 people who went to Paris from Minnesota were T. Drake Hamilton from Fresh Energy and the CEO of XL Energy. And, and it seems that it's for that Sherco plant, that coal plant up by Becker, that where they are making a change to alternative energy force uh, um, um, plant and training the employees that are currently there, uh, along with the attrition that's going to be happening in the next 10 years. Um, but uh, that market forces are driving the, the dependency on fossil fuels and going to all, um, more uh, sustainable resources. What are we doing this, what do you know about this session about climate change? 
Unfortunately, Elaine, there are many of the current um, uh, and others will be talking about it. Um, uh, there's many uh, bills that are being introduced to undo some of the progress that we have made with regards to climate change. Um, uh, and so I know my colleagues and I um, will be pushing uh, back against those things, in particular um, uh, a bill to sort of do away with the, the Public Ut Utilities Commission, um, which is really concerning. Uh, but represent, uh, maybe a hopeful piece is Representative Hornstein and I are introducing legislation around pipelines um, and where they can go and not through uh, fresh water, uh, which, you know, makes a lot of sense to us. Um, and uh, this is one of the things I think that can bring us together with our colleagues in greater Minnesota and just with community members in greater Minnesota who are concerned about, you know, farmland, um, just their way of life. Uh, and if we don't have clean water in Minnesota, um, what do we have? And so I think it's really critical that those are the issues, again, that the governor, um, Speaker Doubt, uh, Majority Leader Gazelka, um, continue to hear um, from folks about. Uh, but it is, it is um, a little painful to see. And some of the regulations around uh, solar, um, disincentivizing uh, people to, you know, um, to, to use clean energy, uh, so it's it's concerning. But I agree, like this is one of the most important issues um, in our state at this time, in our world at this time. And so it's gonna be really critical that people continue to hear, um, hear from us. And I know the governor has made clean water one of his top priorities, um, and so I think he just needs to hear that that is also something that we value. I know there's at least one proposal to eliminate a $15 million incentive fund for uh, residential solar. Um, and uh, uh, Representative Garofalo is, is championing getting rid of that. I don't know if it's got any legs. Uh, yeah, and, and his Tesla, uh, which, which is good that he's driving a Tesla from that standpoint. But, um, uh, so, I mean, we'll see where that goes. You know, we made a lot of progress in Minnesota already on this, and uh, I'd be surprised if any legislative action this year uh, would have the effect of rolling back the substantial progress that we've made. Um, I think, you know, there may be some changes around the margins, uh, and the governor's going to have to stand strong on uh, some of those initiatives. Uh, but, you know, XL Energy is, is a long ways into making uh, their changes um, to taking us to sustainable uh, wind and solar sources for revenue or for, uh, for energy. Uh, you know, there have been a lot of changes companies have already made, communities have already made. Uh, you know, St. Louis Park, you know, as, as, as an initiative initiated by uh, the students in, in the schools here, um, put together a sustainability or putting together a sustainability agenda uh, uh, just for this local community. Um, so it really will come down to all of us doing our part and acting on the levels where we can, and uh, we'll try to fight any damage that might be initiated at the state level. I don't have much <clears throat> much more to add except that I, yeah, I am very worried that we're going to just end up playing a lot of defense this year. So we in particular need to hear your voices to help us play that defense. Um, I, I will put together a petition back here to the governor about that issue and also the one that um, Peggy talked about, the, the fossil fuel uh, initiative. And um, thank you. Mike Hendon, St. Louis Park. Thank you for mentioning the e increasing numbers of our fellow Minnesotans and our neighbors who are people of color in our legislature. Uh, I want you to know that I am speaking in honor of my late grandparents and parents who were immigrants who faced a lot of challenges and discrimination in this community, in this country. Uh, the candidate Trump launched a vicious attack, political attack on our Somali neighbors from our airport not that long ago. And I want to give you some actual facts about our Somali neighbors. And yes, they're our neighbors. They pay approximately $75 million in state and local taxes. Their consumer spending, which goes to our neighborhood businesses, $475 million. Monthly rent, $7 million. Property residential ownership, $165 million. Businesses, three to 600 businesses started. My, my challenge is, for our legislators, is how can you 
make it very clearly public the contributions of our neighbors and real data about issues like usage of public services, et cetera. Because when you get to the web and every place else, there's a huge amount of misinformation and hate speech flying around about our neighbors. And I challenge everybody here, take a moment and greet somebody who looks different than you. Plenty of opportunities in the supermarket, on the street, just a good morning, how are you? You can start conversations almost over almost anything. I've got a kid the same age, uh, you know, and there are lots of clues that you can start conversations with. Get to know all of our neighbors, no matter what they look like, no matter what their religion is, get to know our neighbors, start conversations, take a little step. But again, I'm challenging our legislators, get the economic benefits and contributions of our neighbors out in public. Get real facts about usage of public services out in public. Stop some of the misinformation, or at least give us the tools to say that's not true, and, I, and I'll end at that point. Thank you. The department, oh. Yeah, I was gonna say, Mike, thank you. Uh, just uh, a forum like this is a good opportunity to get that message out. So it's part of what we have done here is help you accomplish that. So thanks, and, and we'll do, I'm sure we'll do everything we can. My name is Tom Green, oh. and I... Tom, hold on just a second. All right. uh, Peggy I, I just you. wanted to briefly state, uh, the Department of Human Services is actually putting together information on how many refugees are in our state, um, the numbers, uh, to give people facts. Um, like uh, Mike said, there's lots of misinformation out there, um, and... Uh, a uh, real effort to divide us. And we live in a district um, and community that is diverse and I believe is welcoming. Um, and we as, as leaders in this community um, have a responsibility to really model that. I um, uh, was proud to stand with many of my colleagues um, uh, just last week um, to stand up and say that, that all are welcome here. Um, and uh, that is really our commitment. As a Native person, Native American person, I care about immigration. Um, and uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, just just know um, just know the value of welcoming the stranger. So I just wanted to say that and just make sure that you know this. We are raised in this community that taught me um, uh, that that we welcome folks, and so it's our job to be good stewards of that and to carry that forward. And you should all know. I mean, we have a, a little bit of a public platform, but we can't always get out to folks. We, not a lot of people listen to a House hearing or, <laughs> or a Senate floor session, or, but we do put stuff out in our weekly updates and having forums like this so that Mike could come up and so eloquently speak is really important. But a big part of that message is from you too, to talk to your families and friends. When you hear misinformation out there, if you see something on the street that's just not looking right and somebody that really needs some help and some protection. So please help be our eyes and ears as well. Thank you. And I'll just add, uh, you know, the, the statistics don't lie on this. Uh, immigrant communities um, have lower crime rates and higher rates of starting businesses um, than uh, people who are born in the United States. Uh, so they are, they are net economic contributors. And if you look at a recent economic anal labor force analysis that was described in the Star Tribune, um, if uh, uh, we are facing a workforce shortage in Minnesota over the next couple of decades as our baby boomers retire. And our businesses, and we have, what, 19 Fortune 500 businesses here that recruit nationally and, that, uh, and many other businesses uh, that do so as well and need workforces that are well-trained and energetic. We don't have the American-born population in Minnesota to be able to fill those jobs. Uh, so the only way we're able to keep up right now is with an inflow of people, and the inflow is not coming from other states in the United States. It's coming from people who are born outside the United States and are coming to Minnesota uh, for the job and for the lifestyle. So for all of us to have a sustainable economy in the long run, um, it will be to our benefit to welcome those uh, who uh, come into uh, this country and into Minnesota. Uh, and that's just the self-interested side of it. Um, there's a moral dimension to this of welcoming the stranger. Uh, if you want to look into you know, in, in faith-based references, 
Um, it's all over the place uh, in ministries and, and, uh, and elsewhere. Um, and uh, just in terms of what is right to do uh, is to welcome those who uh, want to be peacefully in our community. Um, and uh, um, uh, the, uh, the, the demonstration of, of the history is that they do, and they will be peaceful. Um, and uh, I should add, uh, you know, my wife is an immigrant. Um, her whole family came here as, uh, uh, as political refugees from Russia. Uh, so uh, there are lots of people now trying to escape persecution in one form or another. Um, and while I believe that we ought to be vigorously vetting those, we should be vetting and letting people in that we've concluded are safe to come here. Um, and that is the vast, vast majority of those people who are coming here to escape their own threats of death and poverty. That's the kind of country that we were founded to be, and that's the very essence of who we are. So. My name is Tom Green. I live in St. Louis Park. I've got a daughter that's 49 years old who's got developmental disabilities. And uh, uh, she graduated from St. Louis Park Senior High and worked very, very hard to get to where she's at today. The Health and Human Services budget is going to take away a great deal of dollars from the day programs for people with disabilities. Good case in point is Opportunity Partners, which works with about 2,000 uh, people with disabilities. Their budget is going to be cut someplace between 300 and $400,000 over the next two years. Uh, group homes are having budget cuts of between 20 and 25 percent. Uh, I see a crisis in our community but in the entire state, and more than likely in the nation. I mean, we can care about the immigrants, and the immigrants are fantastic, but we really need to reach out to people with disabilities and give them a helping hand. And we can't do that by having the Health and Human Service Department slashing budgets of great organizations that are working day in and day out for people with disabilities. So, I, Peggy, I'm excited to hear that you're on that committee. And, Ron, I know that uh, you'll work very hard on behalf of people with disabilities. So, thank you very much. I'd like to add another little point to that, too. I just signed on to a bill the other day that looks at raising the um, income cap and also the asset limit for folks with developmental disabilities and M on MA insurance. And that's very, very important because to qualify, they need to make less than $900 a month, but they can only really make $750 and they can only have $3,000 in assets. So that really limits them to be able to get a job that they feel productive and enjoy and also makes it really hard. I have a constituent I met with that she can't make more than $785 and her rent is 750 a month. So it makes it really, really hard. But if you take the day programs, which allows them to work, mm -hmm. in both in the community and within those domains, if they cut the funding of that, then they're not going to be able to have money. And they, I read that in the paper today, and it's a fantastic step. But if they cut the budget, Day programs for people with disabilities and group homes, which they're totally under the staff of group homes is ridiculously poorly paid. And they're going to have to play. They will. Yeah, and Opportunity Partners, as Tom said, is a great organization. Not only do they help provide um, workforce, they also do a housing program that's in Hopkins that I've toured and spent time with the folks. So I agree with you. Hi, um, I'm Shirley Johnson. I live at 3087 Zarthan Avenue South. Um, okay, so the first thing is I know I'm preaching to the choir here. Okay, <laughs> this is your annual Minnesota State funding request. All right, here it is. Um, so for the past three years, 
Um, I served as faculty association president for North Hennepin Community College. Um, now, I've kind of returned to my old role as simply a faculty slash irrelevant, or uh, simply a faculty member slash kind of irrelevant, so I'm kind of getting used to my new role. Um, but that doesn't mean that I'm not interested in legislative initiatives that, fit, um, that affect our colleges. Um, first of all, um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Senator Latz for the work that he's doing on the free college. Um, certainly, um, I think that affordability is a critical issue for all of our students, and it's especially critical for North Hennepin students. I also appreciate the work that you're doing with uh, Senator Claussen um, on the tax credit. Um, and I think that those are both uh, really good, viable approaches uh, to help our students. Um, North Hennepin itself, and I don't think the profile, for those of you that aren't familiar with our community colleges, is all that different from most of the metro colleges. Um, about 54% of our students receive some sort of aid. That can be Pell Grants, that can be scholarships, that can be loans. Um, it's a huge issue for us. 86% um, of our students are part-time, and about um, the average age of our students is 27. Um, what that says to me is that many of our students are students that are adults that are coming back to school that are looking for the opportunities that higher education provides them. And the Minsky Community College System, I think, does a great job of offering those kinds of opportunities. Um, I know that our students are interested in cost. That is a huge issue for them. But at the same time, they also recognize that education is a way for them to move forward. And so that opportunity um, piece is really an important part of the puzzle of our student profile. Um, what does all this lead to? Well, one of the things that I would like to ask the three of you to do is to strongly support Governor Dayton's higher ed request. Um, our college, like many of the uh, Minnesota State Colleges, is under extreme financial pressure. Our enrollments are down and the tuition is frozen. What that has led to is cuts. And I'll be very honest with you. It's cuts within our programming, it's cuts of faculty members, and it's cuts of student advisors. Of advisors. Um, when you're looking at the student profile and you put that piece together, um, what it says is that we are increasingly stressed to provide services to the kinds of students that we serve, okay? It's stressing how it is that we go about providing those services. And I'm not sure in all instances that we're providing the best kinds of services to our students because so many of them are first generation. So many of them are trying to find their way through um, higher education, which for many of them is like coming to another planet. And so um, I think that it's important that we recognize that and I think it's important that we support that budget request so that we can get back on track with providing some of those services. Um, finally, um, the last thing I'd like to say is that I believe Senator Senjem is bringing up HEPRA again um, as part of his initiatives. Um, what I would say is that many of our colleges are old. Um, our college right now is, is celebrating its 50th anniversary. And old colleges are something to celebrate, but they also mean old buildings. And old buildings often need repairs. And those HEPRA fundings are, fund, that HEPRA funding is especially important to us. Um, the last note is this. Um, I'm going to leave you uh, today with a gift. That gift is under $5, so you don't have to declare it. Um, it is simply a North Hennepin coffee cup that has within it an important piece of information the number of students from your districts that are attending North Hennepin. So um, I look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you for all that you do for us. And please continue to support higher education. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. George? My name is George Beck, and Julie and I live in St. Louis Park. And before I forget, 
Uh, Representative Flanagan, all of us immigrants out here want to thank you for your work in this area. Um, it, you've been very generous. <laughs> I'm also chair of a new nonprofit called Minnesota Citizens for Clean Elections. And uh, what we do is work to ensure that ordinary citizens have as much input into government as do uh, folks with a lot of money or special interest groups. I just want to briefly touch on a couple things that the legislature is going to look at this session that I'm hoping that you will either support or oppose. Um, there should be legislation passed that prohibits uh, dark money, that, that allows for disclosure of all contributions in political elections. House File 410 provides that. Uh, it presently has 28 co-sponsors, including Representative Joachim. Um, I got very excited this morning because for about two hours it was on the agenda for hearing on Thursday. <laughs> and uh, I, apparently too many people wanted to talk about it and it got kicked out. But uh, it's, it's vital to uh, have voters know who are supporting the candidates that they're considering. Um, and it's important to be able to know when votes are cast if uh, somebody casted a vote for somebody that had a, a dark money contribution. We also need a resolution uh, passed by the legislature to encourage Congress to adopt an amendment to overrule the Citizens United decision. This was a complete disaster. Uh, millions of dollars have... Uh, And 19 states have already done this. Um, I, I can't understand why Minnesota wouldn't be in the forefront on this. I think Senator Marty and Representative Den are uh, the people that are going to carry this legislation. We also need a citizen redistricting commission because legislators have an inherent conflict in setting boundaries for legislative and congressional seats. Um, other states, such as California and Arizona, have done this. Uh, the Supreme Court says it's fine, it's constitutional. Gerrymandering is the top reason why there is gridlock in our legislative bodies. Something has to be done about it. Uh, legislators should not be able to pick their voters. Uh, Representative Joachim, once again, is a hero here. Uh, she is on House File 246, which would accomplish this. Unfortunately, there's two bills that would prohibit any kind of a commission from uh, being established in Minnesota. And I have a feeling that at least one of those is going to get a hearing in the Senate. So uh, that is something we have to be really concerned about and alert for. Uh, legislation has been submitted to repeal the political contribution refund program and the public su subsidy program for candidates, House File 8, 589. These would be seriously regressive steps. Uh, the refund program is our only attempt at public financing, and it hasn't been funded um, in the last biennium, uh, but it should be, and, and abolishing it is a step backwards. Uh, House file 645, legislators or legislative staffers may not act as a lobbyist until one year after leaving their positions. We had an unfortunate occurrence uh, last year in which the House Tax Committee Chair uh, quit, caused a special election, became a lobbyist, and was back at the Capitol very shortly to lobby her committee. This is just unethical, and legislation has to prohibit it. Uh, last week, the House GovOps Committee approved a bill with Representative Joachim voting in the affirmative. Voting no, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> and get this, this awards electors in Minnesota in the Electoral College by congressional district. If this was done, had been done in 2016, uh -huh. there would have been five votes for Trump and five for Clinton. Uh, well, it, it's going to be passed along for inclusion in an omnibus elections bill, so that has to be watched. It's obviously uh, undemocratic, uh, more or less disenfranchises us in the cities uh, in a presidential election. Other matters that are rumored to come up include a driver's license to vote, despite the defeat of the attempted constitutional amendment, and ending same-day registration. Uh, we're living in a time 
when we are seeing serious challenges to our democracy. And so what I'm asking you is to please support laws that allow the participation of all of us in our elections and our government. Thank you. I, I just want to chime in here because um, George Beck is one of the real heroes. Let's just get that out of the way. He's done a lot of work up at the Capitol. He was on the campaign finance board, and he's a former judge. So uh, talk about consummate public service. And I think it's because the bill that was up that we all tried to amend the <laughs> electoral college, getting rid of the electoral college on, um, that they pulled the bill on Thursday because we they don't want us to have any fun. So <laughs> they don't want us to hear, they don't want to hear, let us hear the sunshine law. So no, there are some really bad bills going through. Um, the one thing about the, the, can, the $50 rebate and having, um, having the checkoff box for uh, the public subsidy, what people don't realize is when you take those away, you're also taking away the spending caps for elections. That's a little hidden gem in that bill. So we do have to be on our toes, and we need your voices once again because elections do matter. Um, I'll just piggyback on one thing. Uh, the uh, next redistricting uh, will happen in 2020, 2021, for the 2022 elections. Uh, the next governor's race is 2018, uh, which means that whoever wins the governor's race is going to have an, a large impact on the redistricting process. Um, and uh, uh, if the current majorities remain the same and if the governorship ends up in the same party's hands, you'll have one party control of the redistricting process. Uh, so it kind of highlights the importance of the next gubernatorial election um, and, uh, and, of course, the legislative elections along with it. Uh, but, you know, there's been a lot of talk about citizen <laughs> redistricting panels. Uh, there's been some proposals on the table from some very distinguished uh, retired public servants, um, office holders. Um, and uh, usually you find those proposals from the retired ones because the ones that tend to be in office, uh, if they benefited from the current system, are more reluctant to, uh, uh, to try to change it. Um, so I think we should go back to those discussions. And I think in the long run, because you don't know which side of the aisle you're going to end up on after any given election, um, for the long-term benefit of, of the state, I think we're better off with a citizen redistricting panel. Yes, my name is uh, Jules Goldstein. I live in St. Louis Park. And looking at the length of the line behind me and the time, I'm going to honor request and limit myself to a question rather than a speech and make it concerning s state law. I've had a uh, long-time interest in election law from uh, voter eligibility to the Electoral College. And I note that the st state law does control uh, presidential ballot access. It can and does. So I'm wondering uh, if you would consider amending state law to re and noting that uh, there has been a lot of concern over the last eight years about eligibility of candidates for, pres for president. I'm wondering if you would consider amending state law to a, require a, uh, an affidavit for candidates for president and vice president stating that they are in fact uh, uh, natural citizens of the United States and over 35 years old and that they don't both live in Minnesota to meet the constitutional requirements and oh, while you're at it, also require five years worth of federal election uh, tax returns. <laughs> Uh, I, I can't tell, uh, Jules, if your question is tongue-in-cheek or if, it, uh, if you're seeking responses. A little of each. A little of each. Uh, well, some of it clearly is, is, uh, is tongue-in-cheek. But, um, you know, there is a, a bill out there to propose um, a, a requirement that uh, taxes be disclosed. And, uh, you know what, I'm uncomfortable with that. Um, I really am. Uh, we've got certain constitutional requirements for being on the ballot. There's some procedural requirements for being on the ballot. But once you get into substantive requirements, I get nervous. Um, I get nervous as to, you know, what's next. Um, and, uh, and I get nervous about making requirements, particularly about financial disclosures. Uh, it seems to me that the voters um, should be appropriately asking for these things um, and that we can take into consideration whether a candidate is willing or not willing to disclose that information. 
Um, but making it a procedural requirement uh, for getting on the ballot in the first place, I'm not comfortable with that. Um, so. And I have to be honest, Jules, I, don't, I haven't really thought that much about it, so I'll have to talk later. I'm Diane Steen Hinderley from SLP. And uh, the same year that I came to this um, suburb, I joined Amnesty International that very year. And they've concluded now after over half a century being all over the world, they say once a country loses control over its elections, it's a slow but steady slide into thuggery. And um, I kind of feel th these forces kind of um, regressing, I wouldn't say progressing, <laughs> regressing around us. Um, and I just want to briefly mention something nationally with our election. Um, doc not doctor, but um, President Trump now, uh, his path through the Electoral College, he won by 77,000 votes. 22,000 were our neighbor um, state of Wisconsin, and then the, uh, the rest were split between Michigan and Pennsylvania. Um, but uh, luckily, a presidential candidate, uh, Dr. Stein, she was able to get a recount going at least part of the way in those three states. And one box, they found one box, a bigger box in Detroit that had 75,000 discarded um, ballots in that. And I've got stories about some of those ballots. And really, the human eye is the best judge of what the voter intent is. Uh, but my point isn't for us to go back to paper ballots, which is something that should be done, really. Um, like Ireland junked their machines after just one year because they knew it wasn't, they weren't reliable. Um, but um, she was able to do this because, um, I mean, it's just the, the value of multi-parties that uh, <coughs> I think I'll build on uh, Ron Lance's statement that you need multimodal transportation. And we really need multi-parties also because they can do the uncomfortable things <coughs> that the major parties can't really do because they're locked in this kind of a two-party boxing match. Um, and uh, like um, Hillary Clinton could not have really mounted a recount because she would have met that rhetoric about you're a poor loser or you're being political or whatever. But third, fourth parties have that freedom to really go after the truth and it's not shut down and shut out like it is with just a two-party fight going on. So I really, this will be coming up, I'm sure. I, they, we haven't got bill numbers or bill names, but it'll be coming a ranked choice voting um, option in Minnesota. And we have to be mature enough to get along with one another. We don't have to be just locked into two perspectives, basically, because we praise diversity. More women in the legislature, more religious backgrounds. Like in Washington, there's a Hindu now, and that's stated with pride and ethnic diversity with Ms. Flanagan now, so, but can't we have more political diversity than just seeing Democrats and Republicans all the time on the national and state level? Start slow, just start getting along with each other. It can be done. That's a good reminder, and I think that um, ranked choice voting is something that um, we should definitely be looking at statewide, so thank you. I do want to make one correction. We do still have paper ballots here in Minnesota, which we have our, our homegrown hero. Mm -hmm. Steve Simon, who's watching over the Secretary of State's office, and uh, a reminder that those constitutional officers are up in two years as well. Can I? Yes, go ahead, please. Well, uh, thank you for having me tonight. Um, and let's wish Mark Dayton well because of the situation he's going through with cancer. And again, thank you guys for coming here. Uh, I'll make this real quick. Number one, I work in near 15th and Nicollet. This doesn't pertain to here, but I would like to see gun violence or anything, usually gun, be a federalized crime like they did with carjacking. Carjacking went way down after it became federalized. If you worked at the Nicollet Diner in the middle of the night on Friday or Saturday, at least once on each of those days each week, you're on your stomach on the floor because somebody decided to whirl a gun, shoot at the windows, shoot in the parking lots. And after only making 950 an hour, that gets a little perturbing. Our combat veterans go through less gunfire in some cases than we do at the Nicollet Diner or even, and as my boss at my other job at Ryan's Pub, which is just 100 feet down the street, said, bullets are for bad for business. <laughs> um, next thing, BCA, 
Bureau of Criminal Apprehensions, or I call them Bureau of Corrupt Attitudes. We need to refine their spectrum of paradigm to stay out of private business. Since when do you need a total security background check to roll burritos at Chipotle, which there are now in your district, um, Mr. Latz, seven Chipotles on your watch? And nobody with a criminal background check can be hired at Chipotle. But this is rolling burritos. Um, I myself filed over 2018 applications before I got a job, and I am an ex-offender that cannot pass a BCA background check. And I was hired on the spot at three places, and they said, you're fantastic. When I got the BCA background check, I was ousted out. Again, we have BCA doing our security monitoring, and I won't go into San Bernardino and the other places that have had problems. And I'm not trying to say let's ex out terrorists. I'm just saying it does not stop crime. But washing dishes, cooking at Perkins, does not require you to be a, a scholar citizen. We need to let people get into the workforce. And this BCA is a bigger wall than the one that Donald Trump's tried to build in Mexico. And it's locking out diversity. It's locking out people who are trying to get back on track. And we talk about this being a Judeo-Christian nation, and yet we throw forgiveness out the window. I don't think that makes any sense if you talk about Judeo-Christian nation. The other thing is I would like to see, if it's possible, that we start putting the Pledge of Allegiance in the school. Again, we are one nation. And we need to go back to the basic that we respect the flag, we respect our nation, then we start respecting each other. We have gone through many growth and changes, and one of them is diversity it keeps being brought up. Well, you can't have diversity if you don't have a reason to love the place where you're living. Thank you for your time. Welcome, bien viento, and provincia. <laughs> Thank you for Thank your you. comments. Are, are we still doing okay? <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Hi, I'm Joan Hughes. I live maybe, in... I'm sorry. Maybe what I will suggest, uh, we'll finish whoever's in line um, uh, now. So uh, clearly we're going to go a little bit past uh, 740, um, and then we'll formally adjourn. But if those uh, don't feel too uncomfortable, if you, if you have to go somewhere, uh, you know, go ahead. That's fine. But please, Joan, go ahead. I'm Joan Hughes. I'm from St. Louis Park, and I'll keep it really short. My comments center around renewable energy and its effect on climate change. I think Minnesota has to be a leader in really moving away from fossil fuels. And in that regards, there's some bills up that work against that. Senate File 141, which would look at clean coal and um, stifle the solar energy piece of things. There's Senate File 85, which um, looks at natural gas, which is again a fossil fuel, instead of looking at the costs of wind and solar. And then um, House File 235, which would repeal the Made in Minnesota solar incentive program. So those are all moving us backwards when Minnesota really needs to be a leader in this area. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. I'll be real brief. Right, sir. I'm Tom Anderson. I live in St. Louis Park. I'm a union electrician. We like to see jobs come to Minnesota, but I think we have to look at ethics in anything we do, and I'm deeply opposed to sulfide mining in northern Minnesota. It's not going to create any jobs. It's going to leave a, a legacy of bad water, sick people, um, and a huge bill for the people of Minnesota to clean up. So that, I'll leave you with that. That's Tom. Please oppose this. If you can. Thank you, Tom. Hello, I'm Victoria Thor. I live in St. Louis Park. Um, I'm here for three environmental topics. One, I'm very disappointed in Senator Klobuchar co-sponsoring a bill to delist the wolves. Yes. And I would love to see someone introduce a bill in the state of Minnesota that would f forever ban a wolf hunt because the minute that they are delisted, there's a hunting season. So go Wolf Clan, right, Penny? <laughs> um, I'd also like to see robust opposition to the Keystone Pipeline and to the, the Polymet Mine. There's no pipeline that has been successful. This year alone, there's been 220 significant spills across the country, and since 2006, over 3,000. So 
the fewer jobs that they might create, we're putting our environment at a greater risk. And I also want to um, thank Representative Flanagan for speaking about the bomb threat recently where I teach and bringing that to the attention. Um, today, 17 other JCCs received, received bomb threats across the country. And also, um, I was at the, the Women's March and I was there and I heard um, Penny's speech there, so it was very um, welcomed and heartwarming and thank you for that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just say about the, uh, the JCC issue, I, I was scheduled to be there for a meeting uh, that Wednesday night. Um, and uh, I found out about it in the middle of a public safety uh, judiciary committee hearing where the uh, director of the state's Department of Homeland Security was testifying about what they do in Minnesota. Of course, they provide training and, and help and some financial assistance to, uh, to organizations that can be targeted to, uh, for security uh, and surveillance initiatives. So. Uh, heartbreaking to see it happen. Clearly, a coordinated uh, effort uh, around the country. I don't know if the FBI has made any progress in finding out who's done it because it had happened also the week before that um, in other parts of the country as well. Uh, so, uh, part of it, I think, is, is just the, the tenor of public discourse among our Washington leadership. Uh, seems to have given permission, if you will. Uh, to people to do things that they would not have otherwise done that we thought maybe we had gotten to the point where people just understood some things aren't acceptable to do. But it's never acceptable under any circumstances to, to make bomb threats. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, so my, you know, that's, that's my community. Um, you know, my kids were also supposed to be there that night for programs. Um, and so it was uh, very distressing, and uh, we thank everyone who's expressed support um, uh, for the Jewish community and all those others also who use the JCC for, for meetings. Uh, there's a church that meets there regularly on Sunday mornings. A lot of people go to the basketball leagues and are part of the health club there and have other community events there as well. So thank you uh, to everyone who expressed their support for the community. And I want to do a shout out to thank our first responders that handled it wonderfully. And uh, to my sister-in-law, who's the early childhood director there and had a great plan that was put into action. So um, things like that should never happen in our community. People should be feeling safe in their homes and where they work and where they play. And uh, I think we have a good plan, but hopefully we don't have to use it again. Hi, my name is Drea Rolnicki. I live in Golden Valley. Um, I'm a Gen Xer. I've never had health insurance through my employer. I've had health insurance through my parents when I was little, uh, college when I was older, a couple of public programs. Um, I bought my own insurance when I had the money and I've gone without. Since the Affordable Care Act, I've had continuous insurance. Currently, I'm on Minnesota Care. I'm self-employed. Um, I know before the Affordable Care Act, uh, the Minnesota Care was a little bit different of a program. It had like asset limits and other stuff involved. And so um, I'm hoping that I'll survive with what Governor Dayton has said. Um, and, but I know like what's going on in Washington, the funding might change because I know there's some federal funding that goes into the program right now. And I also know like some things are happening like um, Medica is pulling out of all the public programs, and I don't know what exactly is going on with that. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about that? I'm done. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I, I would I would just say um, I I well I'm going to speak for us and say we're going to fight like heck to protect Minnesota Care, um, uh, and and also say uh, that yes, Medica is pulling out. I think um, folks, what happened right? bid low, they find it's it's unaffordable. Um, I do believe that you care is actually getting back in, um, which uh, I think if you're if you're going to be an HMO, uh, you should model yourself after you care because they serve the community very well um, and put uh, especially low income folks and, and their needs um, front and, 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 and just forward. Um, so, you know, we can talk, uh, we should talk a little bit more offline though too. I'd love to learn more about your story. Um, I think it's, it's, uh, it is those stories um, and what you just shared which really make the difference um, and give us sort of what we need to be able to advocate appropriately. Thank you. Hi, I'm Karen Waters. I live in St. Louis Park. Um, I do serve on the St. Louis Park School Board. However, I am speaking for myself with my um, worry list. 
Uh, <laughs> special ed unfunded mandates. Our cross subsidy is in the millions of dollars each year. It hits our general fund, which takes away dollars from our other classrooms. Um, testing limitations and no more bad tests like the pseudo civics test in ninth grade. Really, you guys have better things to do with your time. <laughs> Equity education support, I am all for it. It's the way to go. We do have success. I wanna say thank you for funding All Day K. In our district, we have closed the gap and it is sustaining year over year. We're starting our third year of results and bravo, thank you. Um, no vouchers for private schools. Public schools need to serve the public. We need better oversight of our charters. Uh, school choice is important, but some of those choices are very poor in our communities, and that is at taxpayer expense. Um, finally, the 2% is wonderful. It's a place to start, but you all three know, and some of the people in this room know, that gets us to what, 2006, from in terms of inflation, when you add in all the prior cuts. So the formula is very, very important, but we still have millions and millions of unmet educational funding needs. And I know we're a big chunk of the state budget, but as far as I'm concerned, if we're gonna be successful as a state, we need everybody all in to preserve our economy, to preserve our democracy, and public education is the way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, and thank you for your service on the school board. It's a it's a, uh, it's a lot of work to serve in that position. My kiddo just started at Kids Place. She's in preschool. She loves it. Her preschool teacher is my preschool teacher that I had back in the day, which is sort of the most like St. Louis Park thing to ever happen. But yes, thank you. Hi, my name is Scott Edgar. I was born and raised here in St. Louis Park. Uh, and I am a uh, father of a beautiful little girl who's almost four years old now. Hi, I'm Miriam Zine Edgar. Uh, I also grew up in St. Louis Park, and I actually have the privilege of teaching at the St. Louis Park High School. Um, and the reason that I felt compelled to come up and speak is uh, with the recent JCC issues that have been going on. Um, our daughter is currently in a Jewish preschool. Um, my grandparents on my mother's side came to St. Louis Park in the 50s because it was a city that allowed Jews to live here and it was a safe place. And um, with it, it's not just with the Jewish community, uh, but all over the country is happening with mosques. We've seen violence, hate crimes. Um, it's, it's very scary for me as somebody who has grown up in St. Louis Park and has always felt safe, um, especially being a Jew. Uh, but as a Semitic woman and a mother, um, I'm just, I'm very concerned about safety and what is going to be done with that, you know, for not just here locally, um, but across our nation. And I think also being a teacher and uh, hearing what students have to say and knowing that I am a white woman of privilege, um, I know that there are many students of color and uh, that includes black, brown, First Nation, who also do not necessarily feel safe um, because of things happening with their religious uh, places of worship and within the, in their communities where they live um, because we don't have just students from St. Louis Park. Um, and I just, I just wanna bring up that concern. I don't know what can be done through legislature to uh, help that situation, but it, it's very scary for me as a mother and an educator, so thank you. Uh, well, thank you for your comments. Um, the uh, one thing we should do is make sure we fully fund the Minnesota State Department of Homeland Security uh, for the work that they do to, uh, to help institutions like the JCC and other potential targets uh, have plans in place when emergencies arise and, and have uh, surveillance and, uh, and other design issues that can help protect them. Uh, you know, last year, uh, I guess I'm trying to think now, if it was last year, the year before, um, I had the bill that uh, enhanced the penalties for felony assaults that are motivated by bias. Uh, this year I've introduced a bill to apply that bias enhancement to all crimes, uh, not just assaults. 
Uh, and so that's one thing we at the state level can do. Uh, and uh, but you know typically I, these I, go I ahead. have one more question yeah. um, I know one thing that was brought up in an email to us and by the way we love where our daughter is we are just so thankful that she's there um, but one thing that was talked about is that there is not necessarily like a solid safety plan and I don't know if there's like a law that is in effect that requires all preschools and school like I know as a high school teacher we have to have safety and lockdown drills but that's something that I feel is very important and not just for Jewish schools that's for like all preschools mm -hmm. um, I, I can add to that I this last interim I actually worked the interim before I worked at a high school at Hopkins but this year I worked at early childhood special ed at Harley and we did have a safety plan I don't know if it's mandated but we did the lockdown drills with the kids and the um, evacuation drills with the kids. So, but I can we can look in that and see if that's um, I, if it's a mandate or not, and if it goes beyond public schools. Um, Harley Hopkins has a public and a private component, so I'm not quite sure where that is. Yeah, I just think as as a mother, it would make me feel so much better knowing that there is an actual plan, like a, a law mandate saying that there has to be a safety. Uh -huh. Well, and as parents of children in those uh, yeah. facilities, you should ask the facility as yeah. well mm -hmm. yeah, if they have a plan. If they don't, uh, tell them they should get one. Yeah. I think it's part of um, my understanding that it is likely part of the parent aware rating system uh, for child care and preschools. Um, so I will look into that for you, and we should talk more about that. Thank the you. other thing I think we should look at is California has introduced a law called No California Data for Religious Registries. It's just one thing that we can we can do, and um, I would like to uh, introduce that. Um, so we'll be talking about that. But the biggest thing, um, so many of you probably have received my uh, RE updates, um, and uh, one of the things that I talked about was standing up and making sure um, that in the face of you know, anti-immigrant rhetoric, anti-refugee rhetoric, um, the, the issues of threats experienced by the Jewish community, that we have to continue to speak up. Um, and I think that these things will continue to come at us, right? And unfortunately, the current political climate, as Ron said earlier, has created a space where somehow this is appropriate behavior. It is not. Um, and uh, I think that uh, we're going to experience more of this um, over the, the coming months and years. And um, we may feel a little fatigue. And at that point, it is critical for us to look at each other to care for one another, to cheer each other on, and to be unafraid uh, to stand shoulder to shoulder and to say not in our community. You know, I grew up here too. I love this place. And it's the reason why we're raising our daughter here as well. Um, and we have to do all we, we can. I received several uh, Minnesota interesting emails um, in response of folks uh, who had hate hateful rhetoric. Um, and uh, it's just part of the job. Right, we have to stand up and make sure that we're advocating for each other from different cultural communities, um, so that kind of behavior is no longer allowed to occur. So, thank you for bringing it up. It is um, really, it's why people live around here, yeah. and it's going to continue to be why people live around here. And thank you for extending it so that we could have the opportunity to speak. So. Sure. You know what, what's interesting is, uh, you know, I, I first started serving on the St. Louis Park City Council in January of 2004. And in the fall of 2000, I'm sorry, 1994. <laughs> Give or take. <laughs> Give or take, yeah. Um, and uh, I was elected in November 1993. And that fall, some of you may remember, there was a bagel throwing incident at the St. Louis Park High School hockey game with Robbinsdale, uh, where some Robbinsdale students or parents, fans, threw bagels onto the ice rink, obviously in reference to the fact that St. Louis Park was a, a center of the Jewish community. Uh, I have no idea if there were any Jews on the hockey team at the time or not, but it didn't matter. The message was sent. Um, so um, at the uh, city council, the first meeting I had on the city council, I introduced a resolution condemning the bagel throwing incident. But at the same time, uh, uh, working to facilitate communication with Robbinsdale School District to set up their uh, participation in the Anti-Defamation League, JCRC's uh, program called A World of Difference, which was an educational program that would teach people how to recognize and understand and appreciate the differences that we have between us. 
So uh, first of all, I guess the message is, you know, this is a thousands and thousands of year old problem. It's not going to go away just because we say so. Um, we can certainly try to push some of the behavior back down underground where it belongs. Uh, but secondly, we should take the opportunity to educate one another, uh, and especially those that may not have the understanding, may be uh, fearful or of their ignorance of, of those who aren't like them. Um, uh, teach them, let them know their neighbors are real people too. Um, and uh, work, that is how we can make this world a better place for all of us. And ultimately that I think will be the solution if there is one. Thank so. you. Um, any final remarks? Uh, I was just gonna say it looks like we're drawing to a close here. We'll stay after for a few, some few questions, but I wanted to thank you again for raising your voices and being here. And uh, please remember to sign in as you're uh, heading out if you want. If you leave your email and you're not already on our email distribution list for our updates from the Capitol, uh, uh, leave your email address. Um, if you decide you don't like them, you can always unsubscribe. But uh, we, do, we do send out information about what's going on. So thank you all of you for spending your evening with us. Thank you.